Ocean activated moment. God created a revival and the whole city was turned into a joyous sound that reached the heavens because somebody just went. God just send me, God give me a sign. God, sometimes you need to just went. If you're tired of crying over what didn't work, do something else. I'm gonna lighten it up a little bit today. I'm 71 coming up this year, and the older you get, the more heavier and deep you intuitively want to become. And I'm really trying to resist that, because being interpreted in the English language is called grumpy. Uh, and I don't want to do that. Grumpy prophetic people are downers. Um, so anyway, so before I start this, so we're going we're to have some fun here, and, um, and, but we're going to really see some things about the kingdom and some things that are really resonant in my heart that I want to uh, convey and express. And there are uh, a bunch of sound bites. There could be probably 20 books out of this. We're going to do it in less than seven or eight hours. <laughs> less than 50 minutes. Uh, but let me just tell you this before I begin. Uh, in 1996, I was in uh, Los Angeles, living in Los Angeles, and I um, <clears throat> uh, was on my way to speak on Sunday morning, and I stopped by what we call out there uh, a 99-cent store. You know what a 99-cent store is? Everything inside is 99 cents, including the employees. And uh, so, you know, so I get in the store, and I'm looking for, uh, you know, what prophetic people look for, either hairspray or hairbrush or toothpaste, uh, are, and um, thank you, and be a good cheer. And uh, so I, I'm looking through there, and there's this lady on the telephone that's behind the register, and she's obviously not been in the States long, and she has a really heavy accent. I could hardly understand her. So I'm looking for something there, and I find what I'm looking for, and it says on it, $2.99. And the sign out front says 99 cent store. So I go up to her and I'm going to ask her how come it's two ninety nine if it's a ninety nine cent store, but she's on the telephone and she's talking with someone and I'm annoying her because she's busy at her job talking on the phone and she's telling him I'm telling you I got in an argument with her and I told her don't you call me shut up again and she was going through this thing I said I mean I tell you I said you call me shut up one more time I slap you right and I'm going ma'am ma'am I said can I interrupt and she looked at me like I'm a bug. And I said, this is a 99 cent store, right? She goes, yes. I said, but this is 299. How come this is 299? She said, because everything in this store is 99 cents except the stuff that's not 99 cents. <laughs> and she goes back and looks at me and she said, don't you ever call me shut up again. So I got two takeaways from that I want to give to you. Everything I'm about to say today is 99% God, except the stuff that's probably not 99% God. And I would like to name this message, don't call me shut up. Meaning that I'm going to say what I need to say because I'm over 70 and I'm going to see Jesus soon and I just don't care what your opinion is. I've been sick. Sick to death for three years. I think I've already died and come. I may be dead now. I'm not sure. But I got to get going. here. So, uh, so I had three or four titles for that. Don't want to call you shut up. I got another call, Revival 101 for Dummies. That's for the other conferences working. It's not you, so I noticed you didn't laugh. Don't be so drama-driven. <laughs> or I want to call it, I'm just saying. How about that? But more than that, honestly, I want to give you some random sound bites of fatherly advice. Because I do feel like that we're standing at the very precipice, at the very edge of an unprecedented time, a transitional renaissance moment. And a lot of us are standing at the edge and we don't have the courage to jump. And I'm just saying to you at my age, it's like either jump or get out of the way because I'm jumping. You know, if you're going to stand in the way, move over. Go ahead and jump or get out of the way. And there's some things that I need to talk to you about uh, and uh, about that 
about what God's expecting us and what we're expecting is sort of what is this whole mosaic, this tapestry of uh, revival and end time stuff that God is putting together that you and I are players in. And so I'm gonna throw a lot of spiritual spaghetti against the wall. Some of it's not gonna stick, it's gonna be fast, it's gonna be quick. Some of it may not stick, but the stuff that does stick, you're gonna like it. So uh, if I could just go through some of these and um, some things that are indigenous to spirituality and, and, to, um, and to become uh, or to actually place herself in the path uh, of a move of God and to place herself in the path of an unprecedented experience uh, in human history. Uh, there's some things when you do, but here's the problem. I think we're too spiritual sometimes and too deep for God. And so we forget the practical things because, listen, it's the practical things that platform us and put us in position for the supernatural. We forgot the natural and the super. God is the super. We are the natural. And so if we do the natural, he does the super. So he and I and you and God partner together, become supernatural. He becomes super in our naturalist. Paul put it this way, I have this treasure in a stupid vessel, a clay vessel. So the super's in the vessel. So it's not about you, but then again, it's not about me, but then again, I, I am just a clay vessel that has not a lot of value, but it's not me that's awesome, it's the treasure in me that's awesome. It is not me that's supernatural or powerful or mighty or gifted. It's the treasure in me that causes me to step up to a new level, a partner with him so that he and I can partner together in a supernatural expose. I love it. I love it. So let me give you some things I think that will help you with that, some natural things, because I believe we would abandon the natural and chase of the supernatural, and we've not become supernatural. We've just become weird. Like I said, I'm gonna say it like it is. So, number one, let me talk to you about some things. Let me start with here. I wanna talk about some principles. Let me talk, talk about the principle of motion or the principle of movement. Newton, the law of inertia, says that things that are in motion tend to stay in motion. And of course, you take away this, if things are not in motion, then they never get in motion. There's something about motion, a starting motion that, that, that express, that's expressed uh, in the continuous of motion, and it just keeps going because it's in motion. So there's something about the, that's motion activated, both in the natural and both in the spiritual realm. And you and I both know that a ship in the harbor, although it has a rudder, by the way, a rudder gives direction to a ship, is worthless unless the ship is moving. The rudder does not work until something is happening, until something is moving. So, there's, so the ship is motion activated uh, uh, by, uh, by the engine, but it's guided by the rudder, but the rudder doesn't work until the motion activation begins to happen. And so I've, I've learned something, I think, that is applicable to what God is doing and what God expects from me that's so simple. It's so simple and I'm so deep, I nearly forgot and I didn't want to embrace it. And let me give you a scripture. So I'm gonna give you scriptures for these, just our chapters, not even scriptures. We don't have time for that. Exodus 14. Moses and the children of Israel are running from the plague of Egypt and running from the tyranny of Pharaoh. And they're at the edge of their breakthrough uh, at the Red Sea. They've been promised this breakthrough. And they had two options, break down a breakthrough, and you and I have those same options today. Depending on how you handle the situation depends on whether you break down or you break through. So they were at the edge of their, and they were doing what I call the whiny baby uh, spiritual prayer thing. And it says, and their whine and their cry went up to Moses and they complained to Moses. And as they're standing at the Red Sea with an impossible shift in front of them, an impossible transition, they're about to change history. They're about to go from a stagnant slave mentality of brutality into a Renaissance era of establishing the kingdom of God in a land that flows with milk and honey. The promises of the prophets are just about to fall upon them, but there is something in the way I'm telling you, if you haven't noticed the last few years, something's in the way. 
There's some stuff happening. I want to call this message stuff too. But they're standing at the edge there and they say this. And they say to uh, uh, Moses, are you brought us here to kill us? We're going to die. What are we going to do? And they're crying up to Moses. And Moses, being the premier prophet, says something that I don't think God told him to say. And he says something to the people of God. And sometimes we say this to each other and we think it's spiritual. And we think that we have learned some kind of measure of spirituality that enables us to say something so profoundly stupid, so profoundly stupid. As Moses said, did I just call Moses stupid? I'd prefer to strike that from the record. <laughs> and so standing at the Red Sea and Moses said to the people of God, okay, God wants us to go here. We want to take the land. But he, and I'm telling you, stand still and see the salvation of God. Now that sounds spiritual. The place that we're at right now as a nation, as a people in history, as an end time transitional uh, trajectory that we're on and where we're going, where no man has ever gone before from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord we are being transformed. We're stuck in the two between two glories right now, trying to figure out, do we stand still? Do we go forward? What do we do? And the premier prophet, the man of God said, stand still, don't do nothing. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And God interrupted him. Have you ever given an amazing prophetic word and God said, ain't doing it. <laughs> You're on your own on that. And so God gives him the motion activated principle. And you can read this again later if you want to in Exodus chapter 14. And God says, Moses, tell the people to move forward. M Moses, the prophet, the voice of that prophet said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord says, no, you tell the people to put their right foot out, put the right foot, you know, to go. You tell them to start walking. And he said, and by the way, Moses, you take your hand and you stretch out the rod over the sea. And in that motion, moment of motion activation is, if I can call it that, God performed this amazing miracle and they passed through the Red Sea. And that motion activation that they started had a backlash on the Egyptians and rolled the Red Sea back on them. And it was a full and complete work because God did not let Moses get away with some information that was not relevant for the time that they were in. Sometimes you need to stand still and, some and, and see the salvation of the Lord. Other times you need to just do it. And other times you need to get up like the two lepers that were sitting before Samaria in the famine and said, why sit we here till we die? Let's motion activate something. Sometimes you need to be like the, 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 the broken uh, lame man sitting at the uh, you know, uh, uh, gate beautiful you know, and, and, and Peter and uh, John came by, and, and I love this, and he, he'd, been, he'd, been, he'd been begging since he was a kid. Nobody had done anything for him but feel sorry for him, pity for him. But when Peter saw him, he said, look on us, and he reached down with his hand, and Moshe activated that crippled man and yanked him up by his hand. We need that Peter anointing to motion activate. We need Moses anointing to motion activate the supernatural. Someone has to have the chutzpah. Someone has to have the gravitas. Someone needs to have the, the, the confidence in God that when I step forward in the natural, the supernatural will meet me halfway, and me and God are supernatural. Well, why doesn't God do it himself? Because Jesus said, behold, now I give you power and, to, and power to do the things that I have done. So you are partners in destiny with me. One more little blurb. Like I said, I'm going to be all over the board, but that's good. Acts chapter eight, Philip and Stephen. I love this the best. I started out with this one because you need to hear this one in case I die before I get finished with the rest of them. <laughs> Stephen was a golden boy of the New Testament church. He had started out as a servant with uh, tables. We'll get to that in a minute. If you're not big enough to serve in the house of God, you're not big enough to lead. But anyway, so he was serving tables. He wasn't doing miracles. He was just serving tables. And then he, God elevated him and he activated the supernatural. And in his activation, he began to do miracles and signs and wonders. But tragedy struck. 
Have you noticed a tragedy has struck in this era that we're in? And things got shut down, that tragedy struck, and th people got mad, and the, those that were gathered around were really irritated at uh, Stephen, and they killed him. I'm coming. He was, he was like the golden boy. He was the upcoming uh, uh, poster child for miracles, signs, and wonders, and revival, for a transformation in the New Testament church. He was going to catapult the New Testament church into a whole era, a whole new era of, of signs and wonders and miracles. But something happened, and the whole thing is shut down. It's crashed. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody understood it. And it's this said this. And all the other apostles were standing at the grave of Stephen, mourning over what could have been. Oh, you got to hear this. But Philip was standing by, and it says, and Philip was standing by, and he just went down to Samaria. Oh, boy. And as he went down to Samaria, he began to preach Christ, and he began to preach as he preached. The lame began to walk. The blind began to see. The revival hit that city, it was turned upside down, great joy filled that city. Then all the other grave criers, the grave criers came down and helped him finish up the job he began. The point being this, at the grave of every Stephen, of every promise you have, there's a Philip waiting to just go. There's a Philip, God has a Philip at the grave of every Stephen who says, I, don't, I refuse to stay here and cry over spilled milk. I refuse to stand here and pine away at what used to be. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna go somewhere to the worst place I can go, to Samaria where they hate me. I'm gonna go somewhere. And that motion activated moment, God created a revival and the whole city was turned into a joyous sound that reached the heavens because somebody, just went. God just send me. God give me a sign. God. Sometimes you need to just went. If you're tired of crying over what didn't work, do something else. And if you make a mistake, it's all right. God specializes in dealing with mistake makers. His personal friend was Peter. The worst guy in the world, made all the mistakes in the world. He even called him a devil at one time and then eventually turned over the keys to the apostolic headship of the New Testament church to a total loser. So there's some merit in being a failure. As long as you can say to Jesus, yes, I love you. Because it's a heart issue. He's not looking for a performance issue. Anyway, it's all about a heart issue. The only question Jesus is going to ask you is not how well did you do and, and, and what is your performance and how many, uh, you know, what is your, you know, What's your success level? No, all he wants to know is, do you love him? That's all he wants to know. He's not wanting to know about your track record, your pedigree. 